What's poppin' A Push People? Today we're gonna take a look at the period of 1854 to 1861. This is American Pageant Chapter 19, but also those other books we got you covered. So key idea from last time, in the 1850s the nation was becoming more and more polarized and northern resistance to the Fugitive Slave Act was increasing day by day. And in 1852 a book comes out called Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. And this book basically inspires many, many Northerners to resist the Fugitive Slave Act. And the reason being is it brings the morality argument to the slavery debate. Um, it exposed the horrors of slavery to a Northern audience and also Europeans, especially in England and France. It was immensely popular. And as a result, um, during the Civil War, Lincoln even responds to Harriet Beecher Stowe, so you are the little woman who wrote the book that made this great war. And what you see is the results of Kansas, Nebraska are horrific. It was assumed that Kansas would become a slave state and Nebraska would be a free state. And remember, you know, it basically repealed the Missouri Compromise and what happens as a consequence is bad. Pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces uh, flood into Kansas. In fact, you get an abolitionist group called the New England Immigrant Aid Company sending like 2,000 free soilers into the area um, to try to ensure that popular sovereignty would go the way of no slavery. You have these so-called border ruffians crossing the border. Pro-slavery people from slave state Missouri are coming into Kansas. And what you really have happening is Kansas, Nebraska was an immense failure. Two rival governments are set up. In fact, you get the free soil government in Topeka, Kansas, and you get the slave, pro-slave government in Lecompton. And a big result of Kansas-Nebraska Act was the formation of the Republican Party. And basically, anybody who was opposed to the extension of slavery in the territories, so you get anti-slavery Whigs, you get Free Soilers, you get um, some Northerners uh, from, from different segments of the population, they rally around this opposition party, the Republicans. And it's really Kansas-Nebraska that forms them. Now, Kansas quickly spirals into a civil war that's known as Bleeding Kansas. Open fighting takes place. There's the Sack of Lawrence in 1856, where pro-slavery uh, forces attack the town of Lawrence, Kansas, and end up killing a couple of people, destroying homes and local businesses. Two days later, John Brown, along with his followers, his homies, attack pro-slavery forces at Potawatomi Creek. And what they end up doing is they literally hack to death five alleged pro-slavery people. And by 1856, you got civil war going on in Kansas between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces. There's open fighting. And this fighting spreads to Congress. The beatdown. Charles Sumner, a abolitionist, a senator from Massachusetts, gives a speech in Congress uh, entitled The Crimes Against Kansas, and he basically is condemning the events that are going on in Bleeding Kansas. And what Charles Sumner does is he is enormously disliked outside of the North, is during his speech he also insults a Southern senator by the name of Andrew Butler. And Southerners are outraged, not just for his anti-slavery you know, slavery, uh, speech, but also because he personally insulted Andrew Butler. And uh, a couple days later, Congressman Preston Brooks of South Carolina enters into the chambers of Congress and beats Charles Sumner with a cane over his head until it broke. Charles Sumner was so badly injured uh, that he could not return to the Senate for many years. And what really is happening is the violence over slavery in Kansas has now spread to the halls of Congress. And this inspired more people to join the Republican Party, but also Southerners rally around uh, Preston Brooks. Now, in 1856, you have an election during this tense time, and the Democratic Party is running against, for the first time, the Republican Party is running a candidate for the presidency, John C. Fremont. And the Democratic candidate is James Buchanan, and they pick him because he has nothing to do with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He was over in London during its passage, so he's not tainted by this Kansas controversy. 
There's also another party running, which is the Know Nothing Party, and they pick Millard Fillmore, and they're really kind of concerned about the Irish immigrants, the Catholics, so they're anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic. And these three parties are running, and the Republicans do pretty well for a new party with mainly only support in the North, but ultimately James Buchanan wins. And really, James Buchanan faces one crisis after another after winning the presidency in 1856. Uh, in fact, what happens in Kansas is the Lecompton Constitution. And the Lecompton Constitution was drafted by pro-slavery supporters in Kansas, and it was setting up the territory, and it was a pro-slavery constitution. And the reason why it's passed is free soilers boycott the election. They feel like the, the, the people crossing the border from Missouri are, are corrupting the political process of popular sovereignty, and they boycott the election. And the Lecompton Constitution is approved and supported by President Buchanan but ultimately rejected by Congress. So you have this battle over what Kansas was going to look like, and ultimately, popular sovereignty was proving to be a failure. Not too long after, this crisis is the biggest one, and that is the Dred Scott case. Dred Scott was a slave who sued for his freedom. He was a slave in Missouri, and his master took him, took him to free territory in Wisconsin for like two years. And he sues based upon that, hey, I was in free soil, so therefore I'm free. The case goes to the Supreme Court in 1857, and the Chief Justice, a Southern Democrat, this ugly dude, Roger Taney, is the head of the court. And the court is dominated by Southerners. And the court rules a couple of things in Dred Scott. One, African Americans are not citizens of the United States. So therefore, they could not sue in court. Two, since slaves are property, they cannot be taken away under the Constitution and the Fifth Amendment. And so since slaves are property, that means Congress could not make laws regarding slavery in the territories. Slaves are protected. Owning slaves is protected everywhere because the Constitution says it. And therefore, the Dred Scott case, not only does it rule that African Americans are not citizens, but it also rules that slavery cannot be banned by Congress anywhere at any time. In fact, the Missouri Compromise, which was already overturned because of Kansas-Nebraska Act, is unconstitutional. And for Northerners, and especially the Republican Party, this is seen as an outrage. They have now, the court has now opened slavery in all the territories, potentially. And they condemn the Dred Scott case as a result. In 1858, you have a really famous debate take place between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas, the guy from the Kansas-Nebraska Act, who is a Northern Democrat. And they're, they're, they're debating. Uh, seven debates are going to be held uh, for the Illinois Senate seat between these two men. And these debates become really, you know, the focus of national attention. And Lincoln, during the debates, challenges Douglas on the Dred Scott decision. And he says to Douglas, could slavery be prevented in the territories? Because according to Dred Scott, the answer is no. And Southerners love that. So how is Stephen Douglas going to respond, a Northerner, but nonetheless a Democrat? He says, in his Freeport Doctrine, that territories could limit slavery. And Southerners are pissed. So Douglas stands on principle and says popular sovereignty still can happen. And he rejects the findings and the decision of the Dred Scott case, and that angers Southerners. The results of the Lincoln-Douglas campaign and the debates is Douglas keeps his Senate seat. He wins the election. Lincoln becomes a national figure. He gives his famous House Divided speech during the, these debates. And then finally, Southerners are going to be bitterly divided amongst one another because they're really angry that Douglas took the position he did in the Freeport Doctrine. Another event that you need to know about is John Brown at Harper's Ferry. And this, the violence just escalates. John Brown, the guy from Potawatomi Creek fame, hopes to spark a slave revolt in Virginia in 1859. And he goes with this plan that he is going to seize the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry in Virginia. He's going to spark a slave revolt by acquiring the guns at Harper's Ferry. Things don't go well. He's charged with treason. And he, along with some of his followers, are eventually hung. There's John Brown kissing the baby on his way to the gallows. 
The impact of John Brown at Harper's Ferry, though, is immense. The South is outraged. They feel like John Brown was supported by Northerners and that he was somehow a sent by the North to undermine slavery. Brown becomes a martyr to many abolitionists, although most Northerners uh, don't uh, support his actions. He does become a martyr because he's willing to die for the anti-slavery cause. And it's really one of the immediate causes of secession because Southerners feel like they're under attack and John Brown provides them proof of that attack. And that leads us to the election of 1860. Election of 1860, as I said, the Democrats are split amongst one another. The issue of slavery and sp specifically popular sovereignty and Dred Scott splits them. And the Northern Democrats favor Stephen Douglas. Um, and he supports popular sovereignty and the enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act. But the Southern Democrats don't want him to be the candidate. And you have a split at the convention where the so Southern Democrats favor John Breckinridge. And Breckinridge's position is very clear. Allow slavery in the territories and annex Cuba and make it a slave state. So the Democrats are a mess. In fact, the Republican Party picks that handsome fella. Lincoln is the guy who's nominated. And the Republican platform has a little bit for everybody in the North, for the free soilers, no extension of slavery in the territories. So they're not going to have slavery expand. It can be where it is. They're not against slavery. Two, for the Northern manufacturers, protective tariff. Three, for the Northwest, a railroad that would grow, go across the country. For the farmers, free land, homesteads. And their platform is really simple. There's also another party that runs in the election called the Constitutional Union Party uh, with John Bell. And they basically try to avoid the issue of slavery. Their whole position is enforce the Constitution and the laws of the nation. Southerners, secessionists, say if Lincoln wins, they're going to leave the Union, so let's see what happens. In 1860, the results, Lincoln, the Republican Party, wins the presidency for the first time. The problem, though, is he is a minority president. He gets less than 40% of the popular vote. He does get enough of the electoral vote, but he is not a president with a large margin of support. In fact, Southerners see him as a sectional president. He's not even on the ballot in 10 southern states. And so when Lincoln wins the presidency, Southerners, South Carolina's the first, vote for secession in December of 1860. And by the time Lincoln takes office, seven southern states in the blue on that map are going to be gone from the Union. They are going to leave the Union because they see him as a sectional president hostile to the institution of slavery. They create the Confederate States of America. They nominate a president, Jefferson Davis. And the president at the time, James Buchanan, is still in office from November 1860 to March of 1861. He's a lame duck. He's basically waiting for the incoming president to take office. He does nothing to stop secession. He does not believe that secession is legal, but he doesn't really feel like he has any options to do anything about these southern states leaving. There is one last attempt at compromise. Can we get one more? And that is the Crittenden Compromise. And it is an attempt to avoid a major crisis, and it hopes to calm Southern fears. And it basically has a really simple idea. Let's return the idea of the Missouri Compromise. Slavery would be prohibited in territories north of 3630, and it would be allowed in territories south. But ultimately, Lincoln and the Republican Party reject this because their position, their platform in 1860 was no extension of slavery in the territories. And of course, seven southern states will have left the Union before Lincoln even enters the White House. That's all for this chapter. Hopefully you learned some stuff. If you haven't done so, subscribe, like the video, post some questions, tell like 20 friends about the channel, and peace.